Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's our pleasure to be here today. So I think you're going to find these uh, presentations to be of great interest to you. Those of you who are looking at this as to, with a lot of questions in your mind about uh, who are these people and what are we going to get from them. Let me give you a brief summary of who I am and who the guests are. My name is Phil Scala. I am a retired FBI agent. I worked about 30 years in the FBI, most of that time in the New York City area. Uh, my last 10 years in the FBI were as supervisor of the Gambino crime family, La Cosa Nostra, as we called in the Bureau, not so much La Cosa Nostra, but Murder Incorporated. And Murder Incorporated is something that goes back to the early 20s in the United States, where people felt that there was a lot of political corruption, and the only way for the Italian immigrants to make a living with some of the people who were pulling the strings and holding people down and downtrodden was to have their own rules. And that's how Murder Incorporated started. If you were against the Italians and you wouldn't allow the people, the hardworking people, to make a living uh, in, the, in the dress industry, in the longshoremen industry, and in many of the other trucking industries, they would just go out and kill people kind of reminiscent to some of the bad drug and gang areas in New York and New Jersey and throughout the United States. And there are a lot of reasons for that, but we're here for one reason and one reason only today. And that is to make each and every one of you know that you're important to us. We're not important. You are the reason why we're here. You are the people of great value. You are the people who we are about to discuss a few anecdotes about what it was when we were growing up. In specific, John A. Light, who's someone who we had arrested in the FBI, someone who ran the streets with John Gotti, John Gotti Jr., and that crew that wreaked mayhem in the Queens and New Jersey area. John is someone who I consider a legitimate tough guy, someone who did all the strong arm work and someone who thought at that time in his life was the way to be important and to be of value. The John A. Light that you're going to see here today is someone who is going to tell you that that life was toxic, poison, and led to nothing good. What he's doing right now is, he's a very busy man, and he does this pro bono, which means that no one's going to give him or myself or EC any money to do this, because we respect and regard each and every one of you, each and every one of you. You're important to us. If you can learn one or two things from what we're about to say today, and when you're given the fork in the road about taking the high road in virtue or taking the low road to pop culture and drugs and sex and crime and gangs, you'll know from your parents, your police officers, the people in the school, that's, that's going to give you a one-way one -way ticket down to complete ruin. It will destroy your lives. Right now, each and every one of you have great promise. Each and every one of you can be what you want to be on the high ground. It's going to require a lot of work. It's going to require a lot of sacrifice. And in some cases, it's going to cause a little pain. I can tell you this. The easy way, the easy road will never bring you to your destiny of excellence. Each and every one of you can strive for excellence and perfection. 
If you don't reach that level, you'll still be a lot better off than taking the easy way out. So I'll, I'll come back a little later and give you some anecdotes if you, and questions you may have about, I served five years in the, infantry, in the military as an infantry officer during the post-Vietnam era, and I did some interesting work with the FBI in 30 years. But this, this presentation is more about John A. Light and EC, who had some very, very tough roads in their life, and someone who has experienced things that I hope none of you people have to experience. This is the real street level stuff of pe people who have been there and have done this firsthand. So it is my, my pride and uh, my privilege to introduce to you first speaker is Mr. John A. Light. Hi, boys and girls. I'm here to tell you guys, and hopefully I get through to some of you, because I know when I stand here, I'm hoping that everybody listens to what I have to say. And not just listens, but follows through with their life and becomes successful, happy, and uh, a well-rounded life. Now, I don't know each and every one of your family lives. I heard different stories about all of you. No one lives a perfect life. Nobody has a perfect family situation. But to use that as an excuse to not to be, not to be successful in life is a cop-out. And EC is a perfect example of that. This was a girl that was homeless at one time. And she became a college student, graduated, and she helps kids like you guys to become successful and educated. Now, if you want to follow me, follow me now. If you want to follow my past, my past, I suffered. Spent years in prisons. I killed people, I hurt people, I robbed people, I stole, I used drugs, I sold drugs. There's nothing on the street that I didn't do. And that's why I'm standing in front of you. I was a rich guy at one time. I owned everything, but I wasn't happy. And if you think you're gonna be happy being a criminal, you're wrong. If you think you're gonna get away with it, you're wrong. You got guys like my friend Jimmy, who's a police officer here, and he asked me to do this for you guys. And I'm here to help you guys, help you not to become what I used to be. And to do that, you have to be mind strong. You're gonna have temptation in life. You're gonna have choices. Those choices could be positive or they could be negative. If you make a negative choice, you're gonna have a negative result. And that means in life, you suffer consequences, whether it's in school or whether it's in the street or it's whether you're working. But there's always choices and there's always consequences. Depending on where you want to be with those consequences is where you're going to be in life. There is no easy road. Just like Mr. Scala said to you guys, you can be a Mr. Phil Scala. And you can. Or you can be a Johnny A. Light from the past. That's your choice. It's, your, it's, a, it's a choice right now that you guys have. It's a simple choice. Enjoy life. Go to the beach, have a boyfriend, girlfriend, go to dinner, go to lunch, and spend time with your family, spend time with your siblings, with your friends, and be happy. Or you can think that you're going to be happy following the life I used to follow. That life's a lie. If somebody tells you anything different, I was a legitimate tough guy. And I'm not saying that in a good way, I'm saying it in a bad way. I've been stabbed up, I've been shot at, I've been piped, I've been, I broke almost everything in my body, my jaw, my arms, my leg. I understand what suffering is. I stood in cells, solitary confinement. When you get punished here, I don't know what they do with you. When you're in jail and you get punished, you spend 24 seven in solitary confinement. Not for one day, two days, but years at a time sometimes. I stood in those cells, and I'm gonna take my glasses off, and the reason I have these on is because I have epilepsy, so you guys understand why I'm wearing them. And look at my eyes. I spent hours and days of crying. I told you I was a tough guy, but I didn't tell you the other part of it. That tough guy that you're looking at right here, and there's a ton of guys just like me in jail. If they're lying to you, they're gonna tell you they didn't cry. And so many days I cried for my family, I cried for my kids, I cried for myself. Nobody wants to hear it. Nobody cared that I was crying. 
Nobody cared that I was suffering. I made myself suffer. And I know what I used to do to myself. I did it to me. There is no poor me syndrome. When you have a poor me syndrome, it means you don't want to change your life. You guys are young kids now. You might not have a mother or father. You might have a mother or father. You might have a mother or father that are drug addicts. You might have mother or father that are good people. You might have mother and father that are divorced. No one has a perfect scenario. Some kids might be wealthy. That doesn't make you wealthy mentally. It doesn't make you a well-rounded family. There's kids out there that come from wealthy, wealthy backgrounds. Their mom and dad isn't there for them. So that's not an excuse. Money's not happiness. So you guys understand something. Happiness becomes within inside your heart, your mind, uh, your religion background, whether you believe in God, you believe in something else, faith. But you have to understand, I could talk to you a different way. I could talk to you as real rough, and it's not necessary. Or well, I could talk to you the way I'm speaking to you guys now. But the, the biggest thing is to wake up, open your eyes, and don't have the poor me syndrome. Have the, have the syndrome that you're going to be a winner, not a quitter. Everybody quits, they become losers. Everybody that wins is a winner for a reason, because they don't quit. So when things get rough and you have a hard time, Everybody that's here today, you'll be able to reach out to me anytime you want. There'll be a website for you. I'll answer you. Every one of you is I'll answer. If it isn't me you're reaching out to, you can reach out to Mr. Scal, to Issy. You can reach out to different people. You can reach out to one of the officers that are here. There is no excuse that you don't have anybody. Because you do. That's what we're all here doing. These guys are all here helping you become better people. It's your choice now. Do you want to become a better person? Or do you want to be laying in the negative. And there's kids that are out there, you have a lot of people I talk on a regular basis, that they have that syndrome they don't want to change. Well, my dad hits me. Well, my mom never comes home. That's not an excuse in life. Again, I'm going to use this again. She's a girl that was all alone, came from another country in Nigeria, came here, became successful. That's a woman. When you look at her, look at her, and that's an example to be like her. You know, you got different role models you can look and you can be. If you turn around and look at some of the officers here, those are role models for you guys. When I was a kid, I looked at them and I cursed them. I wanted to fight them. I wanted to be that person that blamed them for my life. And maybe not them individually, but people like them. That's an excuse not to move on with your life. That's your excuse not to be a better person. I was a good ball player. I played baseball, got a scholarship in baseball to college. I ruined that. I ruined that being a tough guy on the street. I ruined that following some of my friends, thinking they were the smart ones. And I, and I followed them right into prisons. And by following them into prisons, you're going to find yourself without a good life, a life that's going to be suffering. Or you can find yourself, like I said, go to school, be educated, learn to be nice to other kids. Major thing, don't bully another child. If you see somebody else bullying another kid, help that child. Tell your teacher. Talk to an officer. Don't think that you're being weak because you're sticking up for somebody that's being bullied. The weak person is the person that's bullying somebody. The weak person is the person laughing while somebody else is being picked on. That's the weak person. Make sure you guys get this right. This is because there's a difference. You're going to have peer pressure from negative kids. Kids that don't want to be alone going down that lonely path, the wrong path. You can choose that path. Everybody has a direction to choose. I don't care if you've been in trouble so far. Some of your kids may have been, some of them maybe not. I've been in trouble my whole life. I'm at this age, I'm 54 years old, and I turned my life around about six years ago. From six years on, I live a good life. I live a happy life, and I enjoy doing what I'm doing here. If I can help one of you kids, I'm successful. And that's what I want to be in life, successful. So I'm hoping that you guys really listen to what we have to say here, and we make a difference for you. I says, it's easy for me to come in each one of your faces and scream at you and tell you, what are you, stupid? You're not stupid. None of you are stupid. I don't care if you're educated, one guy's smarter than the other, one girl's a little more intelligent in math, science. That's not intelligence. Intelligence is everyday living. So you understand. You might not be able to be a doctor or a lawyer. Maybe that's not your professor, profession. A police officer, maybe not. An electrician, a school bus driver, something positive. It doesn't have to be something by a money value. So you guys understand, money's not life. I know that you hear that a lot through different adults. That's not life. I want you to understand. I have a good friend of mine, and his name is Eddie Rojas. 
he grew up, and he was about you guys' age, and his mom was in a gang. And he was walking down the street, and he was shot because his mother was in a gang. His mother was killed. He turned his life around. He did 20 years in a prison. He actually had no choice because he was walking down the street and was shot because of his mother's, his mother's lifestyle, not his. And he changed his life around. These are examples. There's one example after another that you can live either a positive life or a negative life again. You could follow a ball player, Alex Rodriguez, New York Yankees. Enjoys his life, great life, positive speaker, positive lifestyle. Or you can follow somebody that you see on TV, gangster selling drugs. And if you watch that gangster selling drugs and you see the money and see the cars, you're watching a lie. You're going to watch that man suffer somewhere down the line. And if you have any belief in God, as I do, he's watching down, and, and you're going to pay that price. This is somewhere down the line you're going to pay that price. And I hope that you guys really understand what I'm talking about. It's easy to say, I don't know how many days a week you guys are here, but I spent decades in and out of prisons. Not a day, not a two days, not a year, not six months. I wasted, wasted my life. You have one life, one path you can take, that path to the left, is a life that you're going to enjoy. You're going to be happy. You're going to have family, kids, yourself as you get older. Or you could take the path to the right. And if you take the path to the right and it's the wrong path, you're going to understand what crying means, suffering means. And I'm hoping that we can change all your kids' lives and you understand this. I'm going to pass the mic to Is and see what she has to tell you guys. And I hope you guys are, are listening and we'll join back in in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Hi guys, how are you? How's everybody doing, everybody great? Well, good morning, thank you so much for having me. Well, my name is Isiwa Egodin, but my nickname's EC for short. John calls me EC, so you guys can call me EC. Well, um, I, when I was 17, I became an unaccompanied youth. So if you guys don't know what unaccompanied means, it means like a child without a home, a child without a guardian, or a child without a parent, like you know, a teenager. Um, so I became an unaccompanied youth at the age of 17. So to give you a little bit of background of how I grew up and who I am and what I do. So I'm Nigerian, born and raised, and my family moved to America. And things were really rough and my parents had to go back to Nigeria because of some financial problems. So it was just me and my sisters. We're six girls in my family, no boys, all girls. It's a lot of drama, a lot of cattiness, a lot of sharing clothes. But it was always fun growing up with my sisters. From them, I learned how to be a boss. I watched my sisters get their first houses, take themselves through Ivy League colleges. And I literally saw them grow up and be the woman that I wanted to be. So I ended up moving with one of my sister, and we weren't really close. You know, you have six girls, and I'm the last born of the, ba of the family. And one of my sisters, I had to move in with her because of some financial reasons, and we weren't really the best of friends. So I remember clearly one day we got into a really big argument, and that was the day when I was going on an interview for my second job. Actually, no, I was starting my other job. And this was, and then she was going through a lot of financial problems, a lot of relationship problems. She was just going through a lot at work. So when we got into the argument, it kind of made her upset, and she kicked me out. So you guys are probably like, oh my gosh, she kicked a 17-year-old out. Yes, my own blood, my own family kicked a 17-year-old out. So it was really hard and tough for me. I just didn't know what to do. I remember I was like, oh my God, where am I going to go? My friend, my best friend at the time ended up taking me in and she allowed me to stay in her house. And from then I was just going to school, working two jobs, and this is all at the age of 17. I had a full class in high school. I was like, I had full hours, all my classes. And the thing about me in high school is that nobody knew what I was going through. I was always like the hustler. I, I was always a hardworking person. I sold candy in school, like I sold chocolate, um, Cheetos, Lay's for like a dollar around. I sold Capri Suns, like anything you name it, I sold it around school. And nobody really knew that I was homeless. Nobody knew what I was going through. I was always coming in with a smile on my face. I just always had the mentality that everything was going to be okay. So 
later on, fast forwarding, this is to my senior year of high school, and my friend I was living with, my best friend, her and her family ended up kicking me out as well. So I guess her mom just couldn't take responsibility of putting a roof over somebody else's child. It got a lot, and I was devastated. And I remember I sat in my, it was the last day of school, and I sat in my class, and I literally broke down crying. This was the first day after, what, a year and a half or two years that I actually opened up to my teacher, and I told him that I didn't have a place to go. So it was hard, and I was crying, and I just, I just wasn't really sure on what I was going to do next. Because I was also working at ABC2 News, which is a news station in Baltimore, and I was hosting, and I was reporting and producing. It was an internship, and I got that by myself. I got that internship by actually emailing about 30 people in the TV industry, and I said, hi, my name's Isua. Um, I'm about to go to college soon. I don't know what I want to major in, but um, can you tell me about your career? And I ended up landing a job at ABC2 News, which was super cool because I got to be on TV for like six months straight. And even the people at ABC2 News, they didn't know what I was going through. So I got a lot of comments and teachers' reactions, and everybody was like, you can't go to college in New York. You got to stay in Maryland. I was living in Maryland at the time. They're like, you have to stay in Maryland. And me, I don't take no for an answer. I don't believe in no. I believe in following my dreams and doing what makes me happy. And everybody said, how are you going to go to school in New York? How are you going to pay for it? You don't even have a place to live now. And I said, I can't be in Maryland because this is not what my future is. This is not what I really want to do. This is not what makes me happy. So I applied for scholarships. I worked two jobs. I, you know, like, like you guys have, wait, so how many of you guys have a parent who is in America right now, who is in your household? Show of hands. Okay, great. You guys cherish them, love them. So when I was going off to college, I didn't have anybody to come and see me off or show me colleges or take me to orientation. So it was a little bit hard for me. And everybody was like, stay in Maryland. Um, I ended up applying to like 12, actually no, like 20 scholarships. I applied to 20 scholarships. I ended up getting eight scholarships to college. Um, I funded my first year of college all through scholarships. And it was really exciting and amazing. And my, actually, my school counselor actually brought me, I go to Pace University now, my school counselor actually brought me and sent me off to college, which was amazing and heartwarming for me because I didn't have my mom and dad, and I wish they were here. I didn't have them here to send me off to college. So my thing to you guys is don't take no for an answer and always follow your dreams. It's been really, really hard, but I've been able to turn everything around. My first year of college was successful. I have a 3.7 GPA. I take 18 credits, and I work two jobs right now, and I'm still always doing what I want to do. So my goal is to be a television personality and do TV and do radio, and I've been able to do that now. I've made a lot of connections where I've gone to shows and I've gone to go talk to people, and I've spoken at school, and I go to Pace now, and I'm a junior, so thank God. So, you know, I'm in my third year. I'm almost done. So this is just a big step for me. So if you guys have a dream, you have to follow it. Follow your passion. You guys are already taking the first step by being here. So this is already, like, a good step for you. So don't take no for an answer. Do what you want to do, but also stay focused. And I know you guys are probably like, oh, her sister kicked her out, and I should be angry, and I should be mad. It took me a very long time to kind of move past it. You know, being angry at her is just like she wasn't a mom. She wasn't my mom. She wasn't my dad. She was taking up a lot of pressure for being somebody's sister and turning it into the mom and dad. She was providing for me, taking care of me, cooking, and all that kind of stuff. So... I understand, and at that time I was very angry, and I was always mad, and I was always getting, I wasn't really getting into trouble, but my attitude was horrible. It was, everything was bad. Like, my energy wasn't good. So it's all about your energy. It's all about changing your mindset. So the first thing you have to start off with is being happy with yourself and understanding that it's not your fault, and even though the person did you wrong, don't really technically blame them for that. They, had, they were going through their own life, so you just have to find a place in your heart that you're content and you're happy and 
you just feel good, and then everything else will work place. So fast forward till today, I'm 21 years old, and I am my junior year of college, like I said, and I've had a vision and I have had a goal. Throughout all this craziness that's happened in my life, I've always had a vision board. And this year I set out a vision board that I wanted to travel to at least three places this year. So first I went to Jamaica in February. Second, I went to Cuba for my 21st birthday. I did charity work in Cuba. And third, by October, I'll be at my third place. I'm going to Dubai. So as a 21-year-old, I have two jobs, 18 credits in college. I'm still able to make my goals come true. So it's all about focus, it's all about motivation, and it's all about having passion, finding your passion, and making sure that you don't let anybody else's voice block out your own inner voice. So thank you. Thank you, see. So, again, if there's two or three things that you're going to remember outside of the, the presentations, it's uh, difficulty in life and what we call in psychology degree of difficulty. How tough it is in somebody's life and how they can climb, scratch, and claw to get out of a hole and become somebody of honor. For those of you who watch a lot of movies and TV, right now uh, we hear a lot about SEAL teams and SEAL Team 6 and special operations. The, America has been involved with the war for many, many years in Afghanistan, Iraq, and we hear a story that, first of all, everyone who serves in the military is brave and distinctive. But there, there are degrees of difficulty in the services. And just because you're at the higher levels, what I found is the people at the higher levels, the people who were in Marine Recon and the Army Rangers and SEAL Team 6, the higher you go in degree of difficulty, those people don't think they're any better than the people down below. The people at the higher levels, or as they call the tip of the spear, who do fighting each and every day, who see their brothers and sisters in arms get killed and mutilated by, by explosives, they never talk about what they did. They never say they're any better than anybody else. But it's all about a discipline. And discipline is a word that comes from disciple. So who are you the disciple of? Your parents, your grandparents, a theology? The worst thing you want to do is to be a disciple of yourself. If you're going to follow your own rules, then you're going to be spinning in circles. You're going to be doing things that may give you a little bit of joy and happiness for five minutes, ten minutes, one day. I can assure you that when you're a disciple of yourself, it's going to go nowhere. The reason why I bring up the degree of difficulty is because those men and women who decide to take that ladder or that step up in life to basically use virtue. And virtue is the concept that the ancient Greeks back in the days of Aristotle and, and Socrates and Plato, way before the birth of Christ, were looking for the good life. How does one attain the good life? And all these people did was study how the good people had good lives. They asked a million questions, especially Socrates. That's why they say the Socratic uh, method is about asking questions. Socrates would never pontificate to anybody. He would ask questions. Oh, you look like you're good in this area. Tell me what it is you did that made you so good. Oh, you look like you're doing this very well. Tell me what you did to make this perfect. Oh, you do this very well. Tell me what you did. And that's what Socrates did. He asked a million questions. And it was all about 
how does one attain the good life? And they all came up with the one concept of veritus in Latin, which means virtue, striving for virtue. So when you hear John A. Light, who in his degree of difficulty on the street was at a 10 level. When you hear stories from EC, who came from Nigeria, had nothing, and has gotten to herself to the point where she speaks without an accent, and she's gone to academic training, and she has a dream of where she wants to be in the next three to five years, she, was, she had nothing going for herself outside of a belief in something greater than herself, virtue, and something that she held on to, no matter what the adversity, no matter what the difficulty, she hung on, on to it. When John left the life, there was something that he hung on to, and that's virtue. It's a lot of virtues, some of the things that your instructors will be teaching you over here, but I want you to know that the people that you've seen here today on degree of difficulty were at the 10 level. These are not somebody who you, you, know, you turn around and yawn about. These are real people who lived a high degree of difficulty in their lives. And there's somebody who you people should basically put in your mental uh, background about when things get tough in your life, don't quit. Never quit. Understand that vice is poison and toxic, and virtue is strengthening. And those, those virtues are what you're here in this one week with the Hackensack Police Department to learn, but you're gonna learn from people who have lived a very, very stressful, arduous, and difficult life. And where they're at today is only because of the fact that they've become disciples of virtue. So uh, I've already spoken too much. I'm going to hand it back over to John. He'll give you some more anecdotes. Hey, you guys, uh, I'm going to throw some names at you. Tell me who you know. Mikey Merlo. You know him? Anybody know him? Kevin Pittman. Anybody know him? Greg Ryder. You know him? Angelo Costelli. You know him? I can keep going on with those names. You know why you don't know them? Because they were all killed at young ages. So they never got a chance for anybody to know them. They never made their mark in this world. They never get to have the chance to have children. They never had the chance to be successful because they chose the wrong path. I want to make sure that your kids ain't one of those names or don't become to be one of those names. What's your name? Excuse me? One day, do you want people to know who you are? Do you want to have children? Do you want to enjoy life? Would you rather be at the beach right now instead of sitting here? Truthful. Of course you do. Everybody wants to enjoy life. That's part of enjoying life. For you guys and girls that want to be fighters or get into trouble, you ever watch MMA? You ever watch boxing? You really want to box? You really want to fight? If you want to fight in school, if you want to fight in the street, then don't go join a gym. You can fight every day till you're sick of fighting. I grew up in a ring since I'm three years old, four years old. My dad made me go downstairs and fight every single day. So there's positive ways if you want to be fighters. But if you really want to be fighters, you'll be successful. No shortcut. And I'm hoping, really, really hoping that some of you are listening to some of these things we're all telling you. This is for you guys, not for us. My life's already passed. I, did, I chose what I chose. And I suffered those consequences. I mean, you got to think to yourselves, Mr. Phil Scala is one of the guys that was involved in putting me in jail. Why do I not dislike this man? Why do I praise him? Why do I look up to him? You think about that? I suffered a lot of years of my life because of some of the work that he did against me. But yet, I speak highly of him. I praise him. I wish I was him. I wish I followed that life. I wish he was chasing after me at your age, just what we're doing now. Because of him is the reason I'm up here. 
and I change my life, and I get to enjoy my life. That's the reason why I don't dislike him. That's why I look up to him. He did to me what I'm trying to do to you guys now. I want to be able to make sure that you guys are up here enjoying your life like I am now. Because of him, he saved my life. Guys, because of guys like him, they saved my life. Because of these officers back here trying to save your guys' lives. They might yell at you and you might say under your breath, and I know you probably do, he's probably cursing at them because they're yelling at you. They're yelling at you because they're trying to open up your mind so you guys understand. One day you may be wearing a uniform doing the same thing to another child. Something you can be proud of. And I'm hoping you guys really understand this going into this next school year. It was really nice talking to all of you. I hope if there's any questions that we're going to open it up for a, a question and answer. If any of you guys want to ask any of us questions, any of us at all, please ask us what you want to ask. Anybody have anything to ask us? Not one question? How about if I ask some of you a question? What do you want to do with your life? You want to be the president? That's great. And, and see what she just said, that she wants to be the president? That's not a dream. That could happen, just like it happened for her. When she was living on the street, people said to her, oh, you'll never graduate college. You'll never go to school. You could be anything you want to be. Go dream, dream the biggest dream you can dream for and go after it. Don't be a quitter. All you guys, I hope you have a good school year. And uh, it was great talking to you. And I hope that uh, some of this resonates for you. When I got in trouble in this country, I knew I was going to be arrested. I knew I was facing a life sentence. And I ran out of this country, and I ran to different countries. I ran to Africa, Cuba, um, Argentina, Brazil. And in Brazil, Interpol, if you don't know what Interpol is, it's an international police force that's worldwide. They arrested me in Brazil. And I spent uh, two and a half years in some of the worst penitentiaries in the world in Brazil. In those penitentiaries, I witnessed guys, and so you understand, it's not the United States jails, it's a lot different. I witnessed guys with their heads being chopped off. Uh, 11 individuals specifically, uh, their heads were chopped off and they were left in the institute for about uh, a little more than two days. So I've seen things that uh, you kids and people should never see. And I witnessed and been involved in things that you know, after doing what I've done, uh, you don't sleep well. I have a very good friend of mine, and, I'm, and uh, I didn't mention him, and I need to mention him. His name is Frankie. His brother was Bruce Goddard up. And almost what I'm saying about Phil, Frankie became my friend. Frankie is a guy who me and my friends murdered his brother. So you, you understand that. We took his brother's life, but yet he became my friend. He gave me a second chance at life. And the reason he gave me a second chance at life, is anybody curious why he gave me a second chance at life? He gave me a second chance at life because he wants me to give you guys a first chance at life. He, wants to, he wanted to make sure that by me getting a second chance for killing his brother, that maybe I could save one of your lives. And he wanted to make sure that I would come out and do exactly what I said I would do in prison. I'd come out and I'd try to talk to you kids. So you understand, I'm not under any kind of program. I'm not under parole. I do this because I want to do it, not because the judge is ordering me to do it. And I'm here to save your life because I took Bruce Goddard up's life. And I'm hoping that you guys mean something to Frankie, to myself, and to his brother up in heaven. That we know that we reached you and that you don't become a statistics like we did, whether it's in jail or, or, or death. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you guys, I know it's hard to understand because you didn't live it, and I want to make sure that you don't have to live it. Because when you live it, you'll never understand the suffering. And we're trying to avoid that. I'm trying to avoid that for you. These officers are trying to avoid that. Mr. Scala, EC is trying to avoid it. We all want you to have a good life, successful life, uh, a happy future. And only you can make that happen. And hoping you guys do make that happen. And remember what we said earlier about bullying, uh, be an advocate. People that bully, so you understand,
Does anybody know why anybody bullies somebody? Do you really know what the reason is? And I'm going to use the president, or the future president. Do you know what the reason is? Usually it's this, the person that's bullying another individual is because they're insecure. They're insecure in their own insecurities. They're carrying it out and pushing it off to somebody else, hoping they can deflect it in themselves. So when you watch another child being bullied, make sure that you tell somebody, help that person, give that person a hug when that next person walks away. You don't have to confront the bully. But as an individual, everybody wants a helping hand. And again, I'm going to tell you, Phil put his hand out for me. I shook his hand, and he helped me go where I'm at today. And uh, I really appreciate you guys doing the same for the next child that needs it, or next kid, or next friend, or even an adult. But uh, try to do the positive things in life. Thanks again, everybody. Appreciate it.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Just watch this camera. 